last week we talked about how it's important when you set a goal, when you have something in sight, that you have a plan for when you get there. Um, that you know what you're going to do. You know, when people come into come into that, and maybe it's a position of power. And this sounds uh, sounds kind of funny to me on the speakers. I don't know. Um, when you come into a position of maybe you have power, maybe you have wealth, maybe you know whatever it is that goal that you reach, you have to have a plan because some people haven't thought that far ahead. They don't know how to handle that stuff. And the way we talked about this in, with the um, the Israelites finally coming into the promised land. God, before they even got there, God gave them the plan of how they were going to do things, how they were going to divide up the land. So last week we covered a lot of chapters. Um, we covered chapters 12 through most of 21. And for the most part, these chapters were covering the actual process of dividing up the land. It talked about the actual territory, what the land encompassed, um, the the two kings that Moses defeated and the 31 that Joshua defeated and described the territory that by defeating them what they took. Um, the, uh, then the, the chapters after that, how that the promised land was divided up. You know, the, um, God had said the larger tribes would get a larger portion, smaller tribes a smaller portion. Um, and then it gave kind of a detail by tribe, by tribe, clan, by clan. So. There was a lot of that repetitive kind of thing, you know, detailing these areas. Um, but we talked about that that's how we were able to have a map. Do we have a map? You know, these descriptions, you know, we go down, when we want to know what our property lines are, we can go down to the courthouse and look at a map and see, you know, where the surveyors have drawn off our property lines. Well, you know, they didn't have that. But by having this recorded history of this is the land that was given to this tribe and to this tribe uh, you can see how it was divided out and remember we talked about how Simeon they took some out of Judah um, here to the right you see the tribes the Transjordian tribes that wanted to stay on that side of the river the territory they were given and so that kind of shows you the size of the tribes because that's how they were allotted by so you see how they were all divided out. Benjamin just has that little tiny bit. But that's how they were able, were able now to have these maps. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, um, Ephraim kind of goes up to the corner and Dan is on the side there. So it's not, and then Manasseh is above it and around it. Um, and there was East Manasseh and West Manasseh. So even that half tribe kind of split in half. Half of them wanted to be on this side of the Jordan. The other half chose to stay with the rest of the Israelites. Um, in dividing up the land, there were some promises that had to be addressed. You know, we talked about how Caleb had been promised a certain inheritance because of his extraordinary faithfulness to God. Remember, he was one along with Joshua that gave the good report. Um, there were cities of refuge that were established throughout the land. And then the Levites, they were not given a territory, but they were given towns and pasture land for their, for their livestock. So those things had to be taken care of too in the allotment. And then we talked about how Joshua took his allotment last. You know, he could have been, he could have said, well, I'm Joshua and I'm the leader and I've done all this and I'll, this is what I want. And he could have taken half of it. You know, he could have thrown around his weight, but he didn't. He was a servant leader. Remember we talked about that he is a is a Christ-type kind of um, person in the Bible. No, he's within Ephraim. He just took a city. That's all he wanted was a city. And then there, we talked about how there were still other people in the land that needed to be driven out. But God said, don't wait, you know, because there were pockets of, you know, people that they still needed to drive out. He said, don't wait. Go ahead and drive, you know, we'll go ahead and divide up the land and we'll drive them out as you conquer the land. Okay. So, but we also read where there were several cases that when the tribes went in to take their land, they weren't able to drive them out. You know, in some cases they just weren't able to drive them out. In some cases they went in and they took them in and made them forced labor. So basically made them slaves. So that's kind of where we ended 
So we're going to start with Joshua 21, verses 43 through 45, because this kind of just comes at the end of all this description of how the land was divided up. So it said, The Lord gave to Israel all the land of which he had sworn to give to their fathers, and they took possession of it and dwelt in it. The Lord gave them rest all around according to all that he had sworn to their fathers, and not a man of all their enemies stood against them. The Lord delivered all their enemies into their hand. Not a word failed of any good thing which the Lord had spoken to the house of Israel. All came to pass. Isn't that wonderful? All came to pass. And they lived happily ever after. What? No? That's not how the story ends? What? Yeah, we all know that that's not that's not how it how it ends. But that's at this point of the, at the, of the story, things have come to pass. They've been given rest, so they've reached that place. So now, what do you do with it? Right? God has fulfilled His promise, but it's up to us what we do with that. The example, a good example, is that promise of salvation. We can do good with it. We can grow with it. We can live in it. Others might take it for granted. You know, when we, we accept it and grow in him and share with others, but then others might take it for granted and just say, yeah, well, I'll, yeah, I'll start going to church next year. You know, there's, you know I'm doing all this. I, you know, I've got time. We take it for granted. And then there are others who reject it altogether. So God, he's done his part. He's fulfilled his promise. But it's up to us what we choose to do with it. We can accept it. We can live in it just like the, the Israelites. They were given the promised land. They could live in it. They could dwell in it. Or they could reject it. Now you would think with the victory and the division of the land, there'd be a lot of love going around, right? But it's amazing how fast things can change. So we're going to start in chapter 22. We're going to start with verses 1 through 6. Wow, that's really small. Then Joshua called the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh and said to them, you have kept all that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you, and have obeyed my voice in all that I commanded you. You have not left your brethren these many days up to this day, but have kept the charge of the commandment of the Lord your God. And now the Lord your God has given rest to your brethren as he promised them. Now therefore return and go to your tents and to the land of your possession, which Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you on the other side of the Jordan. But... Take careful heed to do the commandment and the law which Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you to love the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, to keep his commandments, to hold fast to him, and to serve him with all your heart, with all your soul. So Joshua blessed them and sent them away, and they went to their tents. So you remember when they went to Moses and said, we really like this side of the Jordan. It's perfect for our flocks. We'd really like to stay here. Moses got a little bit upset with them at first. But they said, hey, we, we understand. We're going to go with you to the promised land. We'll go and we will stay until every enemy is defeated before we'll come back home. And Moses said, okay, if you will do that, then that's a deal. We'll give you, then you can have those lands. So now it's time to let them go back because they have fulfilled that promise. You know, once that's fulfilled, you've got to release people to do what, what you've promised. And it's been, we know, more than seven years. We talked about last time they said it was probably around seven years or so that it took them to conquer all the promised land. And that's a long time to be away from your family. You know, we think, talk, think about our servicemen and women who are away from their families. And it's usually not seven years, I don't think, but it probably feels like that <laughs> when they're gone for a year or two. But they've been gone for a long time, and now it was time to keep their promise. Verses and the thing that and before they left, Joshua, you know, who's very very important that he reminded them 
because they were going to be going away from everybody. They were going to be on the other side of the river, you know, and they were all, everybody else was there, and that's where the temple was going to be over there. Is don't forget, don't go over there and forget who God is. Continue to worship him, to live in him. So it was very important that he reminded them of that. Verses 7 through 9. Now to the half-tribe of Manasseh, Moses had given a possession of Bashan. But to the other half of it, Joshua gave a possession among their brethren on this side of the Jordan, westward. So that's where we talked about there was the eastern Manasseh and western Manasseh. And indeed, when Joshua sent them away to their tents, he blessed them and spoke to them, saying, Return with much riches to your tents, and with very much livestock, with silver, with gold, with bronze, with iron, and with very much clothing. Divide the spoil of your enemies with your brethren. So the children of Reuben, the children of Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh returned and departed from the children of Israel at Shiloh, which is the land of Canaan, to go on to the country of Gilead, to the land of their possession, which they had obtained according to the word of the Lord by the hand of Moses. So not only are they going back to their families, they're going back to their families richer. You remember all those battles now, and they couldn't at Jericho. They were told they couldn't take anything. But then in subsequent battles, they were told to go in, and they, you know, they called it the booty. They would take the spoils, all the, all the riches. So now they're going back to their families, and they're taking this wealth, and he's saying, when you go back, share it. You know, spread it out. You know, so they're going back enriched from that. Verses 10 through 12. And when they came to the region of the Jordan, which is the land of Canaan, the children of Reuben, the children of Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh built an altar there by the Jordan, a great, impressive altar. Now the children of Israel heard someone say, Behold, the children of Reuben, the children of Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh have built an altar on the frontier of the land of Canaan in the region of Jordan on the children of Israel's side. And when the children of Israel heard of it, the whole congregation of the children of Israel gathered together at Shiloh to go to war against them. Wow, where's the love? Just a little bit ago, they were all, you know, crying and hugging and saying, have a safe trip, you know, and then the next minute they're ready to go be at war with them. <laughs> Somebody posted something on Facebook somebody didn't like, right? <laughs> But they, so they, but they, you know, when, they, when these folks left, they built this big, impressive altar. And the people in Israel lost their minds when they heard about it. So we've got to figure out what this is about. Why is everybody so upset? Okay. Verses 13 through 16. Then the children of Israel sent Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the priest, to the children of Reuben, the children of Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh, into the land of Gilead, and with him ten rulers, one ruler from each of the chief house of every tribe of Israel, and each one was the head of the house of his father among the divisions of Israel. Then they came to the children of Reuben, to the children of Gad, and to the half-tribe of Manasseh, to the land of Gilead, and they spoke with them, saying, Thus says the whole congregation of the Lord, What treachery is this that you have committed against the God of Israel, to turn away this day from following the Lord, and that you have built for yourselves an altar, that you might rebel this day against the Lord? Ooh. So first of all, before before they just go straight to war, they're like, okay, let's send Phineas, let's send these other heads of the household to go ask them. What a great idea. Let's go ask them, what did you mean by this? Why did you build this altar? Because they had already made an assumption. Don't we, we do that? We go ahead and we make assumptions about things first before asking questions. They assumed that they were building it to serve some other god. They assumed that it was something to disrespect their god. They made a lot of assumptions. And we all know what happens when you assume. Well, I'll break it down. Why is it that we immediately think the worst? We immediately think the worst of someone when they do something that we don't understand. When we don't know the reasons for why, we do, why they're doing it, we assume the worst. It's human nature, I think. And that's what they did. They assumed the worst. Verses 17 through 18. 
Is the iniquity of Peor not enough for us from which we are not cleansed until this day, although there was a plague in the congregation of the Lord? But you must turn away from this day from falling, Lord, and it shall be if you rebel today against the Lord that tomorrow he will be angry with the whole congregation of Israel. And Phineas is like, don't you remember what happened the last time we messed up? <laughs> you know? God, remember that was when God was mad because of the sin with the Moabite women, the sin they had with the Moabite women. And there was a plague, and it killed like 24,000 people in the camp. And it only stopped when Phineas drove the spear through the man that brought the Moabite woman into the camp, and he dr drove the spear through them. He's like, don't you remember that? You know, let's remember the mistakes we've made. Let's not make those same mistakes. Verses 19 through 20. Nevertheless... If the land of your possession is unclean, then cross over to the land of the possession of the Lord, where the Lord's tabernacle stands, and take possession among us. But do not rebel against the Lord, nor rebel against us, by building yourselves an altar beside the altar of the Lord our God. Did not Achan, the son of Zerah, commit a trespass in the accursed thing, and wrath fell on the congregation, all the congregation of Israel? And that man did not perish alone in his iniquity. You know, this is, this is an act of love, really, by Phineas, what he's saying. He's saying, if, 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 there's, if that land is bad where you're at, you know, if it's unclean, don't stay there. Come back. Come back and live among us in this land that God promised us. Well, that would mean dividing the land up some more. People would have less, you know. But it would be worth it if it meant their brothers would be saved. That takes love. I read this quote of one of the commentators. It says, too many of us lack this willingness. We tell people to stop sinning, but we are not willing to help them if it costs us something. Ouch. We're not willing to help them if it costs us something. Phineas was saying, we're willing to take that cost. We're willing to give up some of our land for you to come back and be among us if that's what it takes to keep you from falling out of the will of God. And then he says, in case, in case you didn't remember the plague, don't forget we just had Achan sin. That would have been fresh in their memories. They would have remembered that. He's like, let's not make the same mistake. And so now they get their opportunity to reply. Verses 21 through 23. Then the children of Reuben, the children of Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh answered and said to the heads of the division of Israel, The Lord God of gods, the Lord God of gods, he knows, and let Israel itself know. If it is in rebellion, rebellion or if in treachery against the Lord, do not save us this day. If we have built ourselves an altar to turn from following the Lord, or if to offer on it bird offerings or grain offerings, or if to offer peace offerings on it, let the Lord himself require an account. You're saying, hey, if that's the case, if we were doing that, if we were really rebelling, then we deserve, we deserve death. Don't save us. Okay. Verses 24 through 27. But, but in fact, we have done it for fear, for a reason. You know, if you stop and you ask people before you assume things, you might find out they had a reason for the way they did things or what they did. It says, for a reason, saying, in time to come, your descendants may speak to our descendants, saying, what have you to do with the Lord God of Israel? For the Lord has made the Jordan a board border between you and us. You children, I lost my place, sorry. For the Lord has made the Jordan a border between you and us, you children of Reuben and children of Gad. You have no part in the Lord. So your descendants would make our descendants cease fearing the Lord. Therefore we said, let us now prepare to build ourselves an altar, not for burning offering nor for sacrifice, but that it may be a witness between you and us and our generation after us, that we may perform the service of the Lord before him with our burnt offerings, with our sacrifices, and with our peace offerings, that your descendants may not say to our descendants in time to come, you have no part in the Lord. So they were thinking ahead. They're thinking, you know what, we're going to go to the other side of the river, and, you know, it'll be for a while, but then if 
five years, ten years, twenty years from now, what if they forget us? What if they forget that we're a part of them? And, they, they, and we try to come and worship with them, and they're like, well, you have no part of us. We want something that will remind everybody that we are the same people. And so that was their reason for building this altar. They wanted this altar to be a reminder that, hey, we are a part of you. We might be on this side of the river, but we are the same as you. We are God's people too. And we don't want you to forget us. They didn't want to have any sacrifices there or any offerings. It wasn't going to be used what you would typically use an altar for. It was to be a witness, to be a reminder. Verses 30 through 31. Now when Phinehas the priest and the rulers of the congregation, the heads of the divisions of Israel who were with him, heard the words that the children of Reuben, the children of Gad, and the children of Manasseh spoke, it pleased them. Then Phinehas the son of Eleazar the priest said to the children of Reuben, the children of Gad, and the children of Manasseh, this day we perceive that the Lord is among us, because you have not committed this treachery against the Lord. Now you have delivered the children of Israel out of the hand of the Lord. So this explanation satisfied them. You know, oh, they understood. Isn't that amazing when we actually talk to each other and explain what we're doing and what's going on, how much smoother things are. But sometimes we forget who talk to each other. And sometimes we just go off and do things. We need that communication. We need to always be talking to each other so that we understand each other and understand what's going on. We can all be, it's hard being one mind and one accord when you don't know what's going on in it. <laughs> you got to know what's going on. So anyway, now they don't want to fight anymore. So that's, that's wonderful. Okay, so verse 34. The children of Reuben and the children of Gad called the altar witness, for it is witness between us that the Lord is God. Okay? So this altar is called witness. The altar most likely was made out of stones. That was the most common material for making, making an altar. In Exodus... 20, verses 20, 24 through 25, it talks about what altars could be made of. It says, An altar of earth you shall make for me, and you shall sacrifice on it your burnt offerings and your peace offerings, your sheep and your oxen. In every place where I record my name, I will come to you and I will bless you. And if you make me an altar of stone, you shall not build it of hewn stone, for if you use your tool on it, you have profaned it. So it had to be made out of earth, okay? um, and if they made it when it was made out of stone, it couldn't be stone that they had taken tools to to form it. It had to be natural stone, you know, that, that has been weathered or by the wind or water. It couldn't have had a, a tool. So likely, this was an altar made out of stones, uh, and they said it was a great and impressive altar. So it probably took them some time. To, to gather up all those stones and to, and to put that together. And they called it witness. You know, we think of a witness as somebody who can speak, who can tell and give an account of something. Okay? Well, obviously the rocks don't have mouths, but the fact that it was at a great and impressive altar made of stone and it stood as a symbol, the people would remember, they would continue to tell their children to remember what this stands for. So we're going to look at another example where stones were used as a witness in the Bible. Okay? And for that, we start in Genesis 31. We're going to start with verse 45. Go through 50 to start. So Jacob took a stone and set it up as a pillar. Then Jacob said to his brethren, gather stones. And they took stones and made a heap, and they ate there on the heap. Laban called it do my best here, Jagar, Zahadutha, but Jacob called it Galid. And Laban said, this heap is a witness between you and me this day. Therefore, its name 
was called Galid, and also Mizpah, and those words mean basically witness. Because he said, May the Lord watch between you and me, and when we are absent from one another. If you afflict my daughters, or if you take other wives besides my daughters, although no man is with us, see God is witness between you and me. On down to 51 through 53. Then Laban said to Jacob, Here is a heap, and here is a pillar which I have placed between you and me. This heap is a witness, and this pillar is a witness, that I will not pass beyond this heap to you, and you will not pass beyond this heap and this pillar for me for harm. The God of Abraham, the God of Nahor, the God of their father, judge between us. And Jacob swore by the fear of his father Isaac. Okay, so this was when, of course, Jacob had left and taken his family and was going back to his homeland, and Laban pursued him. And God told Laban, mm -mm, don't bother him. <laughs> And so they made this heap and this pillar to be that witness between them that this was where they were going to part ways and neither one was going to cross that line to do any harm to the other. So these rocks were symbolized the witness. God was actually the witness. But that's what those rocks symbolized, the witness between them. Okay. Um, so just like with Laban and, J and Jacob, the heap, the pillar of rocks, this impressive altar that the children of Israel made in the desert um, between the, the Jordan was also a witness. And again, like we said, they can't make a statement. They can't obviously speak, but they do make a statement because of what they represent, this covenant that they represented. And there are many times in Scripture, all through Scripture, we find where people, people built altars and heaped up stones for a purpose. In some cases, it was to build an altar to have that communion with God, to make sacrifices, um, a place where God's presence was at. So we're going to look at a couple examples in Genesis. Genesis 12, 7 through 8. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your descendants I will give this land. This is going back to the beginning of our story, right? <laughs> I will give this land. And there he built an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. And he moved from there to the mountain of Bethel, and he pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and and Ai on the east. And there he built an altar of the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. So, you know, they had to have that, that altar was that place for that communion with God. It's where they had their sacrifices. Um, if you go down to Genesis 24, verses 24 through 25. And, this is, and the Lord appeared to him the same night and said, I am the God of your father Abraham. Do not fear, for I am with you. I will bless you and multiply your descendants for my servant Abraham's sake. So he built an altar there and called on the name of the Lord, and he pitched his tent there, and there Isaac's servants dug a well. So here is Isaac having that time where God spoke to him, and he built an altar there. Okay? Verses, uh, Genesis 28, 18 through 22. Here we have Jacob. We have Abraham, Isaac. Now here's Jacob. Then Jacob rose early in the morning and took the stone that he had put at his head and set it up as a pillar and poured oil on top of it. And he called the name of that place Bethel, but the name of the city had been Luz previously. Then Jacob made a vow, saying, If God will be with me and keep me in this way that I'm going, give me bread to eat and clothing to put on so that I come back to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. And this stone which I have set up as a pillar shall be God's house, and all that you give me I will surely give a tenth to you. So here's another, and there are several places where Jacob had these encounters with God, and he built an altar, if you go through and you read. Okay? So it wasn't just before, also in 1 Kings, we see an example in chapter 18 with Elijah. Verses 31 through the beginning of 32, it says, And Elijah took twelve stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, Israel shall be your name. Then with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord. Okay? And this is where Elijah rebuilt the altar that had been there. So those were times, that, there was also times where the stones were used and built to make a memorial, just like this, this altar that we just read about in Joshua. And it goes back into earlier chapters of Joshua, which we covered not that long ago. Chapter 4, verses 4 through 7. Then Joshua called the twelve men whom he had appointed from the children of Israel, one man from every tribe, and Joshua said to them, 
cross over before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of the Jordan, and each one of you take up a stone on his shoulder according to the number of tribes of the children of Israel, that this may be a sign among you when your children ask in time to come, say, What do these stones mean to you? Then they shall answer them with the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord when it crossed over the Jordan. The waters of the Jordan were cut off, and the stones shall be for a memorial to the children of Israel forever. Remember, this is when they were crossing the Jordan into the promised land. The ark went in first. The waters receded and stood as a heap, and they crossed over on dry land. And then before they were done, they got those stones and put them in the middle so that in the times when the river would go down, they would be able to see those stones, and they would remember what they stood for. Remember to tell your children this was when God parted the Jordan for us to cover. So those stones stood as a memorial for that. Okay. Also in Joshua, not that long ago, we talked about uh, chapter 8, verses 30 through 32. Now Joshua built an altar to the Lord of God of Israel in Mount uh, Ebal, as Moses the servant of the Lord commanded the Lord of Israel, as is written in the book of the law of Moses, an altar of whole stones over which no man has wielded an iron tool. And they offered on it burnt offerings to the Lord and sacrificed peace offerings. And there, in the presence of the children of Israel, he wrote on the stones a copy of the law of Moses, which he had written. So you remember, this was after they finally had defeated Ai, and they had the, the worship celebration, and they stood at the mountains. One was the mountain of blessings, one was the mountain of curses. And he built this altar, and then on it was written the law of Moses. So anybody that came across that could read that and see and know what it represented. So all these cases, and there are many more, these altars represented times of communion with God, times that commemorated things, <clears throat> great things that God had done for his people, for his promises that he had kept. So I want to look at this verse and see what you think. Luke 19, 37 through 40. Then as he was now drawing near the descent of Mount Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But he answered and said to them, I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. These stones, they might be able to keep the people from talking, but these stones are all throughout Israel, and they all represented things that God had done for his people, his promises, including Jesus, who was a promise. The stones would cry out. There's, there's so much more to this, and I would encourage you to study this on your own, to start looking into these stones and what it means. It's, there's so much more to it. But these stones would cry out. They could keep the people quiet, but you can't keep these rocks quiet. They make their own statement. They tell us to remember, remember the promises that God has made. 